It's time once again for the Real People Multi Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. I am making a huge, unprecedented decision today, right now actually. Um, I kind of actually mo made it moments before as I was using the bathroom prior to filming. Um, that's actually a pretty, pretty appropriate image. There are times when I want to play a game, but I don't want to film. And I think we saw in the last video that that probably was one of those times. But all my space is covered in this game right now. So I had a choice to make what to do. Do I, do I keep with this area that I have down here to my left? Or do I figure out a way to transfer everything to the big table? It's always been ideal for me to have everything on the big table, but it just didn't seem possible. I've since rethought it. If I get rid of the Seven Wonders boards, it should be very possible. Um, we'll miss out on, on people being able to make their own wonders, and we'll, we won't have the variable um, player powers then. But, you know, since they're, they're kind of more of a cultural edifice that spans between <laughs> these different empires, um, anyway, it's not really so important. They already have their different powers with their Duel of Ages people and with the different empires that they're able to get. I, I really like it, asymmetry in games. Um, I think that's important. Um, symmetrical games... I, I'm not going to get on that tangent. Anyway, it's just more interesting to me. So I, I, I think we'll be able to keep that asymmetry anyway, uh, even without the different boards. So, and I think, you know, if I do some, some magic with the counters, I might be able to fit them, you know, all the stuff in their little player area. I just hope it doesn't get too messy. Alright, so it's a little bit more cluttered, especially, and it will be, it'll get even more so after I get um, these Duel of Ages cards you know, as more of those cycle in, and we'll get more and more Seven Wonders cards. Luckily, they're going to go away as people discard Empires. Hopefully, we'll make it work. I think it's for the best, though. Um, I really have been missing having another table to work with, and um, it, it'll make it kind of easier to think about, too. Everything's right up here. You know, it's all there. I don't have to go back and forth, and I can, I can see things when I'm doing someone's turn, and that will make things a lot easier and I think it'll make their decisions both in the seven wonders portion of the game and in the seven ages slash you know the other portion of the game make a lot more sense and then also I think they'll be able to pick their card as they're picking their actions which is how I originally intended so um, the card picking and passing will be during um, the time when people are assigning their actions rather than before it, which will make for a more informed choice, and they'll have their cards on hand, which, you know, I was kind of just going from a vague memory before. So there we have it. That's that's pretty great. I did, uh, I did make one other change if you're going to try this at home. Um, I gave everyone this round the, um, I went through all the decks and kind of pulled out the cards so that they would have the their automatic resource. How I'll do this in the future, I think, is when you start out, um, you'll have, you know, one card of each resource, shuffle it up and deal one to each person, and then you have that taken care of. That way they have something that they can work with to start out with, um, rather than starting with nothing, because then, you know, you pretty much have to get brown cards right away, right? The first turn you'd need to get a brown card, or I guess you could take some of these yellow as well. Alright, so I went around with the cards. Definitely liking it better. I'm, I feel like I'm making more informed decisions on behalf of our real people contestants here by being able to see all the information in front of me when I make the choices, including the cards that are in their hands and blah 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 blah. Um, you know, basically, you know, we're getting down to, to people just kind of, they're having fewer choices. They had three cards to choose from. Um, see, when we get here, I think this turn, or this turn, they're not going to have any more cards to choose from, uh, since they're they're essentially starting. They're doing hands of six instead of seven. There's going to be a, a hand where they don't have anything. So I guess in the regular game, you would just discard the final card. So I think it's it's actually going to be the same. No change. Sorry, I'm just talking. Um, one thing that happened is I looked the other way and let Cowboy take another tavern. Um, I could have said something, but I was. You know, he's, he seems so happy to have all this money. I don't know what he's going to do with it. Um, there's really going to be no end game point where, where he can convert it into points. And we're not playing with the leader's expansion, which makes money um, 
a little more using money to, to get points more attractive. Um, because there are some cards that make it so you get more points for money than you would otherwise. Uh, so, but he likes having it. It makes him happy. And how can you resist that smile? So this is a round where turn order is very important. Um, reason why is because this is the round that someone can get the um, the black army. Uh, most people have gotten two empires going. And you can only get the black army if it's your third. Uh, unfortunately for Flush, he, I mean, kind of fortunately, but it makes him feel bad. He has the turn marker here, uh, which means, you know, if he had an era one empire, he could get the black army if he had another empire here. Unfortunately, he doesn't. And he also doesn't have one in his hand, so he's not going to be able to start an empire. Um, so that kicks it down to Kaz and Cat. She chose a wild card action. I'm not sure if she has an Arrow 1 Empire or not. She's definitely going to take it if she does. Doesn't look like it. Um, Melky also has it. It would be the poor... Yep. Yeah, he has the early fins. So he's going to be able to take the Black Empire. Um, and no one can stop him, even if they had a special event or something, because he has the most of these wreaths. So, there's no, the rich get richer, Milky is going to have the Black Empire. It's not always great to have three empires. Um, you have a little bit more to think about. Sometimes uh, they can kind of stumble on each other, but, you know, if you get the chance, you're probably going to take it, and that's what Milky has done. The trade in progress action is a lot more attractive with uh, the, the inhibitive science rules, since only the people who have the most science cards get to progress. I was actually just thinking about a, a more interesting way of doing that, but I, I, I won't go on that tangent. Um, the, the only way for people to progress is, is through trade and progress. Um, so we're seeing that with Kat here. Kat has all her units, her blue units on the map. She can't, she was going to actually do production, um, which is pretty nice for her. She doesn't have to pay for her units, so having a large army is okay. Um, the reason why she doesn't have to pay is because she's barbarian. And if you're barbarian, you don't have to pay for your units, but you only pull in half as much money. So you really just you want to hold a lot of territory um, and keep moving. Uh, but since she she doesn't have any more new units she can produce because she's, she's ran out of um, pikemen and bow and arrow fellows, uh, so she needs to get one more progress to be able to pull in chariot, chariots, and then she can continue her conquest of Europe. So she she had a lot of a lot of potential trading partners. Um, all of them have yellow cards, however, except for Runt. So she chose Runt to trade with, and I'm going to go ahead and do that now, and we'll see who gets to advance. Both of them would like to take the advancement over the money, I believe. It took her a very large and very good card, the United States. Um, its event, Expanded Glory, lets you double, essentially, one of your empire's glory for a turn. Um, she's betting on the long haul, though, with these guys. She really wanted them to be able to produce. And so she traded it to Runt um, and succeeded. So she's going to get to jump up, too. That's going to take her up to not only can she do chariots, but she can also make boats, galleys. Um, unfortunately, she didn't count on the Amazon's power. Amazon's power lets, if the Amazons lose the trade, they get both cards. Uh, and so that's very good for Runt. Runt was kind of going to win no matter what, get something out of it. She would like to, she would like to have advanced, though, because the Amazons um, do score on advancement. All right, the trade ended up a tie. And here's a case where I'm just changing the rule, <laughs> the actual game. And I feel like Seven Ages really invites this. Uh, not that the rules are wrong or there's anything wrong with them, but it's um, it's a big elephant of a game, which you may have heard me say before, and it's, it's open to have its uh, features messed with. Um, in this case, Trade in Progress, if you have a tie, it says no one progresses. That just feels like an additional disincentive to me to trade. And it doesn't feel particularly thematic. I don't know. I think... There's something to be said for you know, people progressing together. And in fact, the, the science rule, uh, advancement rule that I didn't tell you about, had to do with that. Like, if you had the same science advancement and you're in the same range, I was thinking, well, maybe you guys both progress further than you would otherwise because there's some exchange of ideas. Um, but I'm not going to mess with that so much. But I'm going to say if you tie, you can each advance one. I don't, I think it's, it's silly to just have nothing happen. 
Uh, it just feels like, you know, every other action, there's always going to be something that happens. Here, the only thing that happens is, oh, he gets this card, and she gets that card. And they could exchange money if they wanted, but why would they want to? So they each get a progress, and there we go. Just realized I may not have talked to you about who was actually trading there. <laughs> um, that was the Harappans, which is giraffes people, trading with the Babylonians. And we already know the result of that trade. Giraffes Romans are about to maneuver. They are very hemmed in, and I just wanted to show you the situation here. So, um, over here she has the Greeks. Over here she has the um, Celts Gauls, which are Ka, as in cats. And then here she has the pirate state. Ka just moved into Gaul here. Um, disallowing her own <laughs> her own Celts Gauls from being in Gaul. But she thought, you know, she could have a kind of support the her barbarian friends there. Um, and so really the only place that she can move without fighting is to the Alps. And if she's in the Alps, she's, you know, she's got three different forces, the Greeks, the Gauls, and the, the pirates there. So she's got, she's got some thinking to do uh, before she decides to move. She doesn't want Rome to just sit there, though. Rome is no... No wussy, but they, there's these two empires that have this weird cultural connection that is Kaz and Cat that she really has to think about. Does she want to take them both on? Luckily, the Gauls are um, pretty spread out, and there's, they're not going to be able to make any units for a while yet. Right. I thought Giraffe was going to go through the Alps and then into Burgundy here. Uh, Burgundy over this one, despite this guy's weakness, because going over a river is kind of dangerous. Um, but she's going right for Gaul. Gaul is going to produce more. It's harder to defend against and kind of risky. But what does a giraffe do other than stick its neck out? Um, part, of what, part of what bolstered her decision is she's got stronger units than the pirates. Uh, they're... they're you know, they have an additional strength point per unit, essentially. So, let me see if Cat has any cards to throw in. I already know Giraffe doesn't. She. Alright, so this game is going to go through a lot of adjustments as we go on. Uh, because it's there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of new moving parts, and they none of them have been tested for the most part. Um, but one of those things is... W What's the deal with events? I've already ruled that if you have the most wreaths, more wreaths than the other person, you can play negative events on them. But what about playing events on yourself when in conflict with someone else? That's one issue. And what about doing it in battle? Um, well, how I'm playing the battle cards is if it seems like something that's kind of, you know, just being more mi militant or uh, having more of more of a strategic culture or more military culture would help you, um, then you can play the card if you have more of these. Otherwise, um, if it's like an act of God type of military card, which I think there probably are some, then it's going to go by those. So it's really, it's really going to be hard to say if someone has a secret military advantage going in unless they have um, the advantage in both of those cards. So we have Skewer Punked, which I had to look up what this means. It means Blitzkrieg, I think, because it went to a Blitzkrieg page when I did a search on it. Um, but that doesn't make sense, because Blitzkrieg is already in German, So, but it's something related to the Blitzkrieg, I guess. I didn't, I didn't read too long, because I, I want to be playing a game. Choose one side after forces are committed, but before they are revealed, that's, that's a little different in this combat. During a round of conflict resolution, that side doubles its unit's values for that round. So, basically what this is going to be doing is this is going to be making Capazoids guys twice as strong for this first round of combat. I don't know if Giraffe's going to be able to survive, but we'll see. This could be disastrous for the Romans. So she's got two, six, um, that's eight. So she has a total of 16. Giraffe's sitting on six plus... Eight. That's 14. That's actually not bad. So that, that only gives her a, an advantage of two. Uh, we're going to see what uh, fate says. Oh, not good for Ka. All right, so that's going to still give Giraffe the edge by one point. So, let's see. I guess she's going to have to lose one of these guys right here. And that's probably going to be the combat. Uh, she can go ahead and retreat, however, if she wants. And I think she is going to do that. Gonna retreat these guys right back into there. And Giraffe has taken Gaul. 
So we are really seeing the importance of geography here um, in terms of how, how much of an advantage one has. Now, there are some, some people would hypothesize or theorize, uh, depending on how much evidence they have, that being in an area with more competition would actually make for a stronger empire coming out of it. Here we see, we can, we can kind of gauge if that's really true. Um, under these these rules, I don't. I feel like in this case, it's not good to have the competition because you're going to try just as hard. I guess if we pulled back, everyone is in the same degree of competition on this glory track. So it's just whoever has more forces working against them. Um, but maybe if maybe if these players were actually played by different people and not all played by me. Maybe they, their minds would be forced to work harder if they were in the Europe area where there's more competition than the, if they were off in India or China on their own. Uh, but then we are seeing that the, the leader right now is Melky, who is in the kind of this area right here. So I don't know, but interesting to think about. Just as a way of highlighting what I was talking about. So Giraffe used her whole maneuver action basically to take this one space, which is going to be worth uh, three bucks to her every time she does production in the future. And it's also a very tenuous space because it's between, you know, these two great forces that are allied. Um, cowboy just did, or not Cowboy, sorry, Little Red just did his maneuver action for the Chow over in China. They're all stacked right there, and they were able to take, you know, this whole region all in the same amount of actions just because there weren't any people there and how many how much is you going to be able to pull in for resources each of these is worth five so you know she went to all that effort just to just to pull in three um, and I guess you can if you wanted to really look at it you could you could come up with some number that she gets on top of that by taking away from Kat you know because Kat's loss is her gain if you're if you're playing in a competitive environment but she's getting uh, uh, Little Red's getting 5, 10, 15, 17, 19. He's going to be pulling in 19 more dollars during his production phase um, just from that one maneuver action because there's no one there. And there's a lot of good resources there, and that's just where he, the card he happened to get. Hi, Xena Warrior Princess has just made it to an adventure location. This is going to be the first one in the game, which is why I'm filming it. So she is going to... It's going to work. She's going to turn up this card. The Sphinx has a riddle. So it's an intelligence um, an intelligence test. Her intelligence isn't the best, but, you know, she's, she's of this age. So it's going to be an even chance, I guess, for her to squeak. Um, four legs in the morning, two at midday, three in the evening. That is the classic riddle um, of the Sphinx. Uh, I wish I could tell her the answer. Runt certainly knows the answer. Runt is a, a literature teacher. I believe she's an English teacher in school, so she definitely knows. I bet she's into mythology. Um, but we just have to roll dice. And that's a nine. That's a failure. So, I never thought about what would happen if they had a failure. Uh, she, ha she, she has to go somewhere else, doesn't she? She can't stay there. Hmm, I gotta think about that. In in Duel of Ages, you there's all these little domes, and you'd roll to see which dome she goes to. Um, yeah, she, she could probably stay there. Uh, maybe she has to go to a different location if she wants to try again. I don't know. I gotta think about it. I won't make you listen to me think anymore. All right, I think I know what I'm going to do. We are going to make this failure real. You see in Duel of Ages, uh, set one world spanner or any of the expansions, sets two, three, master's addendum, whatever, um, If you when you take a challenge, it's all this kind of virtual sport. Um, the characters are not actual, it's not actually, wouldn't be actually Xena Warrior Princess. It would be some... Um, some amalgam of this archetype of the Amazon warrior. Uh, so when they take a challenge, it's all this kind of virtual experience. It's not they're actually taking a challenge. We've brought it into this this sort of historical semi well not historical but a, a semi historical world. It's a, the conceit is that this is a real world and this is a actual person running and then challenging the Sphinx, right? And so if you fail the Sphinx, we all saw in the never-ending story, you get shot by laser beams, and that's what just happened to her. She's 
dead. And I'm sorry. Let's think a bit about Flush. Flush is doing his civilized action, and he's getting good things and bad things. And I, I, the good things, I just don't know if they're going to be helpful enough for him in time for him not to be destroyed. Um, here's an example. He, he got a, found a gold mine on his island, right? So he has all his money now, but he can't spend it because he's way back here. Where is, I don't even know where he is. He's somewhere. He's not very far on the progress track. He needs to be able to make boats. Until he can make boats, he's just kind of stuck on his island, unable to get any other um, empires. He just hasn't drawn them. Um... Uh, then he has this great unicorn. It's an administrator. It has a beard. But can the unicorn go anywhere? No, it's it's stuck on the island still because he doesn't have any boats. Then by the time he ha does get boats, uh, you know, there's this there's this other navy that's filling up the waters. And there's going to be this other navy maybe soon because I guess the pirates haven't progressed yet either. So that's not so much of a problem. He is able to progress though. He does have science, so things aren't at the end of the world and he now has the forum the forum is a fun fun artifact which flush i think will enjoy if you want to you can just trade your your action for a bonus turn in the future basically is what you can do um so i think flush will enjoy that i just i'm really worried about him wow and look what um Melky has. Melky has Princess Sunglow. Melky also got two different um, artifacts this turn. It's just, I mean, it really is uh, highlighting, uh, they, they really contrast Flush and Melky. I mean, Flush finally got a few things. He got an, an artifact, the forum, and he got a leader. But then Melky, he got a Princess Sunglow. She's one of my favorites in the game, um, partially because she reminds me of this princess. I, this is how I picture her. I'll show you this princess right there. She's my favorite princess. And I, I kind of want, would love to combine this game with Duel of Ages. He actually could have got another leader, so it's not all rosy for Melky. He had a card that let him draw two. Um, and, but he only got one. He got Princess Sunglow, and, she, and despite her low intellect, she's a scientist. All right, so it's been a busy end of turn. Uh, first, what happened? What? Well, um, Little Red finally let the ancient Iranians go. Not finally. He maybe did it prematurely. Who knows? Who knows what he could have done with them? It was not so much them. It was their scoring opportunities. They just they could only score on having a lot of lands, and there's just too much competition for that right now. Um, I mean, sure, they could spread out and just take a bunch of lands, Right, but they don't have. They didn't have enough units to really get more than the Gauls, or even than his own people over here. So it would have been would have been difficult. Um, then what happened? We came to the progress phase. Flush tried to make it so that only he and I think it would have been Melky would have been the only two who would have gotten um, glory. Uh, he played Glory pour moi, uh, which is one of those cards that. Kind of goes outside of the the map. Um, it's more player oriented because he's French. He takes the glory just for himself. Um, in a regular game, that would make it so only Flush would be able to to have glory that turn. Uh, basically, he's just trying to do anything he can to stay in the running. Because uh, as you can see, people are even cowboys starting to to get ahead of him. Cowboys only pulling in one glory a turn though too, just like Flush. Um, but since he has more of these wreaths than flush, I ruled that he would be exempt. And if anyone else had equal or more wreaths, they would also be exempt. Um, but Little Red, he canceled it out with this bad augury. Little Red had a bunch of cards for, that he's been saving up, and he used a lot of them just now. Um, how else are things looking? Uh, that little the the Iranians leaving the the leaving the game. Uh, oh, and that, sh that actually, since he discarded Empire, he should lose all of these. So I guess they shouldn't, he shouldn't pop forward. I forgot about that rule. Yeah, so all of, um, all of Little Red's cards here are going to go away, except for, whoops, sorry, tree. That's going to stay, because that's his starting resource. These are all going to go back into the deck. And next time there's a deal, these are going to be dealt out as well. So we'll put that there. Um, 
I forgot what, oh yeah, so Runt, Runt is the, the progress leader now, uh, which is helpful to her. She's going to want to hold on to her pharaonic Egyptians. Um, Little Red did start the Nubians here, so that's going to give her, that's going to make it less <laughs> tempting to be the, the pharaonic Egyptians. Uh, it would have been nice for her if she could just take Africa on her own, but now she's going to have to compete with the Nubians. Um, you know, the pharaonic Egyptians look better, but the Kushites, Nubians, they have a better position to start off with in terms of defense, um, not in terms of production. But he's further south. He can um, produce in desert, which is nice. Uh, she she basically has to either go, go here through the desert, which is worthless to her, but she'll have to hold it anyway, and then you know, take take land down here, or else, um, you know, go right through his homeland in the mountains. It's going to be tough for her either way. So that's how things are looking right now. When we end the turn, we have, you know, we still have Little Red and Giraffe capitalizing over here. Let's look at our glory track. Oh, gosh, he took 10 in this turn, Milky. Um, he has hanging gardens in one of those, th in the Babylonians, and that, that lets him score on having... No, he doesn't have Hanging Guardians. I, I think I made a mistake there. Okay, so he should only have eight. Anyway, he took eight that turn. Um, who has Hanging Guardians? Does he have it somewhere else? It's so hard with these little tiny artifact ma markers when I go back and forth. Oh, well. Um, we won't worry about Hanging Guardians right now. Uh, but the Babylonians got a bunch because they have the most artifacts. Um, and... Yeah. Oh, no, they, they only got two. The Minoans, that's where he got it. Okay, so since his Minoans maneuvered, um, he has the most sea areas now, as well as the most boats. That's four points right there. They also hold their homeland. That's one more point. No one else can get the homeland until they get boats. We have some people who can start building boats. They just haven't yet. Um, the only person with a real incentive to do so, other than messing with Melky, is Cowboy. So I think Cowboy will probably be doing that next turn. Um, the early Finns also pulled in a point. So... Five off the Minoans, two off the Babylonians, one off the early Finns. That's eight points. He's got a commanding lead. Again, the glory is only really good for staying in the game. Um, you know, I think right now he's got as much chance of staying in as, say, Runt or Giraffe. Though, you know, things could change and, and uh, Flush or Cowboy could catch up to them. That's where we are right now. With seven by seven ages, we're in the Pope leg of the alpha bracket of the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament.